everyone today we are going to discuss about protein secondary structural prediction this topic is mostly studied in bioinformatics program and everyone who is uh, interested in uh, prediction of protein structures we have usually secondary protein structures and tertiary protein structures so in this video we'll be dealing with the secondary structure prediction and in the other video which is also tagged in this video at the end we'll be talking about tertiary structure prediction so let's start there are levels of protein organization as you know so the linear chain of amino acid is called as primary protein structure and the secondary protein structure occurs when the sequence of amino acids are linked by hydrogen bonds and the examples are beta strand and alpha helix and the beta strand when they in turn make hydrogen bonds with each other they make beta pleated sheets then Tertiary protein structure occurs when certain attractions are present between alpha helices and beta pleated sheet and the tertiary protein structure is actually a specific conformation which is taken up by a protein when it is finally folded in our body and uh, when the uh, these tertiary proteins are uh, you know uh, again arranged in multiple subunits and then they make a bigger protein in turn then the bigger protein is now called as quaternary protein structure and the individual structure is now called as an subunit so mostly proteins in our body they uh, they are at the level of protein uh, they are at the level of tertiary structure but then uh, we have uh, certain examples for example ubiquitin uh, machinery so wherein the multiple proteins they come together and then they uh, you know make a bigger protein and then they function in the body so like I was saying some proteins they function at the level of tertiary structure and some proteins they function only when they have achieved their quaternary protein structure so this is the difference between tertiary and the quaternary protein structure and between tertiary and quaternary uh, sorry and between secondary and uh, tertiary protein structure we have another type of protein structures which are called as super secondary protein structures and I have done a separate video on them if you are interested on super secondary structures please go check that out so now protein secondary structures are stable local conformations of a polypeptide chain they are critically important in maintaining a protein three-dimensional structure so whenever in bioinformatics we are dealing with the protein tertiary uh, structure prediction protein secondary structure prediction is this is the step which goes uh, in the background because whenever we have to predict the structures of the protein in totality we need to know where are the secondary structures lying first of all right so the highly regular and repeated structural elements include alpha helices and beta sheet and other than that we have uh, um, you know uh, coils and turns also but then alpha helices and beta sheets are these structures are mostly uh, which are mostly uh, you know uh, seen and they are like the major uh, secondary structural elements in our protein and it has been estimated that nearly 50% of the residues in a protein they either fold into being a alpha helices or a beta strand so let's know let's understand what is alpha helix now so an alpha helix is a spiral like structure which is on your right and with 3.6 amino acid residues per turn and the structure is stabilized by hydrogen bonds between ith and the ith plus 4 residue and prolines normally do not occur in the middle of the helical segment but they can be found at the end positions of the alpha helix whereas a beta sheet consists of two or more beta strands having extended zigzag conformation so the structure is stabilized by hydrogen bonding uh, bonding between the residues of the adjacent strand which actually may be long range interactions at the primary structural level and beta strand at the protein surface show an alternative pattern of hydrophobic and hydrophilic residues and buried strand they tend to contain mainly hydrophobic residues so now uh, I'll be showing you the screenshots of the software and then uh, then I'll be talking about these three letters called as H, E and C confirmations. So a protein secondary structure prediction refers to the prediction of the conformational state of each of the amino acid residue of a protein sequence as one of the three possible states. H stands for helix, C stands for coil and strands it stands for E here. 
in the prediction and i'll show you how it is uh, how how does it look so the prediction is based on the fact that secondary structures have a regular arrangement of amino acids stabilized by hydrogen bonding pattern like we have discussed just now both in the case of alpha helices as well as beta strands or sheets so the structural regularity serves the foundation of the prediction algorithm because we have a pattern going on in the uh, you know secondary structure so since we have a pattern of how they are bonding with each other right so these type of patterns they set as the foundation of the prediction algorithms which we have developed so predicting protein secondary structures has a number of applications for example let's say it can be useful for the classification of proteins and for the separation of protein domains and functional motifs and secondary structures are much more conserved than the sequences during the evolution so as a result you know uh, correctly identifying secondary structural element can help to guide sequence alignment or improve existing sequence alignment of distantly related sequences so i would like to uh, uh, explain this sentence a little more so let's say uh, if you have ever got a chance to work on schrodinger and i have separate videos on schrodinger as well please go check them out so if you have uh, got any uh, you know uh, experience on these softwares you will see that there comes a point in the in your during your work in the software there where you can uh, you know manually edit the alignment and why is the editing of the alignment a crucial step in the processes like these which is structured prediction because because uh, what we do in tertiary structured prediction is we copy the structure from the homologous uh, sequence for our sequence so if the alignment is wrong the chances are that you'll be copying the wrong structures so if the alignment is wrong you'll be copying wrong structures so in order to not fall into that trap what one can do is while they are aligning their sequences they can selectively uh have the option of looking at which secondary structure is made by both the sequences for example let's say we are aligning sequence a and b together and we are aligning a particular location in a and b and let's say for location a in that position the secondary structural prediction is coming up for alpha helix and the uh, and the portion of b which is matching with that portion from sequence a the prediction for b for the same location is is beta strand so since we just discussed that structure are more conserved than sequences you know you may compare two sequences and you may say that the uh, amino acids of both the sequences do not look like same and we do not think that they are going to align very much but if you will look at the secondary structural le level you will see that these uh, structures are actually same so amino acid sequences may not match but their structure are matching right so if you will take this fact into consideration then you will end up aligning the sequences better so this is what we said just now so in addition secondary structure prediction is an intermediate step in the tertiary structure prediction as in threading analysis which you will see in another video so if you were thinking that secondary structure prediction uh, output is going to be something fancy so my dear friends it is not going to be fancy it is how it is this is how it is going to look like and the output is on your screen right now so it is a textual um, output actually so like i said e stands for strand c stands for coil and h stands for helix so this is how the prediction uh, for the sequence is done so the sequence in front of you which is written in the color black is uh, our query sequence and the rest of the lines are the predictions for the same sequence so this is how the output is going to look like now uh, there are two types of proteins first are globular proteins and the other are uh, transmembrane proteins so globular proteins are those proteins which are freely flowing in our body and they are not bound to any uh, membrane protein in any or in any case but the transmembrane proteins are those proteins which are bounded to membrane in one or the three ways for example it can be extrinsic protein it can be extrinsic protein or it can be a transmembrane or a channel protein right so we'll get that that uh, we'll get to that later 
but right now we are dealing with secondary structure prediction for globular proteins so protein secondary structure prediction have with high accuracy is not a trivial ask so it remained a very difficult problem for decades and this is because protein secondary structural elements are context dependent for example the formation of alpha helix is determined by short range interactions whereas the formation of beta strand is strongly influenced by long range interaction but since prediction for long range interaction is theoretically difficult so even after more than 3 decades of effort the prediction accuracies of softwares like these have only been improved from about 50% to 75% that's it and the secondary structured prediction methods can either be ab initio based which means that we do not have any prior information attached to it which makes you know use of single sequence information only or homology based which makes use of multiple sequence alignment information so now these methods are divided into two types either they are going to be ab initio or they are going to be homology based so homology based is easy to understand homology is homology is when two sequences are related to each other by virtue of their common ancestry so for example insulin from you know homo sapien is homologous to insulin from cow or rat or horse or even a zebra fish so insulin works as an insulin in all these species because the protein is homologous in all these species so for example if i have protein sequence from zebra fish and i want to know the structure of the protein in zebra fish but if i have a similar structure present in homo sapien then what will i do i will use the information of structure from the homo sapien and i'm just going to copy it for the zebra fish right so this is how the methods in homology based sections are used but ab initio is a little different because we are not going to use any homology or ancestral information in order to make it rather we are going to you know rely on the statistics of the amino acid residues and uh, then we are going to work it out so let's say how it is done so ab initio based methods is what we are starting with right now so this type of method predicts the secondary structures based on a single query sequence and it measures the relative propensity of each amino acid belonging to a certain secondary structure element so the propensity scores are derived from known crystal structures For examples of ab initio predictions are chow fassman and gor method stand for Garnier, Osthoud and Robson. The ab initio methods were developed in 1970s when protein structural data were very limited. So the statistics derived from the limited data set can therefore be rather inaccurate. However, the methods are simple enough that they are often used to illustrate the basics of secondary structure prediction. So we are now going to start with the Chow Fassman algorithm and the Chow Fassman algorithm is the primitive method and falls into ab initio based uh, prediction. And uh, what does this algorithm do? This algorithm is actually based on a table and uh, is based on a table and this table looks like this and this table is called as a propensity table and in this table we have propensity scores uh, of each residue uh, for falling into either making alpha helix or beta strand or beta tau so it determines the propensity of intrinsic tendency of each residue to be in helix, strand or beta turn conformation. And how do we know about these in, uh, intrinsic ten, uh, tendencies or propensities or let me call it as a probability. We have uh, learned about these probabilities by studying these structures which are already present in databases like PDB. Okay, so they studied these two people, Chow and Fassman at that point of time in 1970s when the protein structural data was very very less so they devised this uh, you know this table and uh, in this table they had these scores which tells us that in which case did they see a particular amino acid a particular amino acid to be uh, you know falling into a helix a strand or beta turn. for example it is known that alanine glutamic acid and methionine 
are commonly found in alpha helices, whereas glycine and proline are much less likely to be found in such structures. So this is the home page of one of the uh, website which uh, host Chow Fassman algorithm. There are many websites which host Chow Fassman uh, prediction algorithm. So uh, let's see how the calculation uh, is done for uh, knowing whether the uh, amino acid is going to be predicted for H, E or C. All right. So suppose there are N residues in all known protein structures from which M residues are helical residues. So the total number of alanine residues is Y of which X are in helices. So for the propensity for the alanine to be falling into alpha helix. So this is the formula which we are going to use. So, you know, by using this formula, the propensity of each amino acid in falling into these three, uh, you know, uh, uh, these three secondary structures is, is worked out. So let us look at this table right now. Let's say, you know, let's talk about alanine here. You will see that the propensity of alanine is more than one. Here you will see that the propensity of alanine is less than one. So whenever the propensity of some amino acid is actually one, for example, aspartic acid here, you can see it is just one, right? So whenever it is one, it means that it can either be in H, either be in something else, or either can be in coil also. But if the propensity value is more than one, then it is then the chances of the alanine falling into helix is more than falling into the other two types of secondary structure, which is a beta strand or coil. And if it is less than one, which is this value and this value and all these values, so then that means that there is no chance that uh, the alanine will be seen as a beta strand or a turn or a turn or a coil. All right. So whenever the value is more than one, then it is like with the like very much sure that this particular amino acid is going to be seen to be falling into making uh, alpha helix. So prediction with Chow Fassman method work by scanning through a sequence with a certain window size to find regions with the stretch of contiguous residues, each having a favored SSE score to make a prediction. So what it is doing is, uh, let's say, let's say I'm telling you about how it is working. So imagine you have a sequence of hundred residues. So you cannot scan hundred residues at at once, right? You have to start somewhere. So for example, for alpha for helices the window size is six residues and what we are doing here is imagine you have a scale a bigger scale which is having the entire protein chain which is 100 residues and then you have a small scale which is only six residues long and you have set this algorithm in a manner that if if within these six residues if the four contiguous residues have propensity for same type of thing for example if out of these six residues four contiguous residues say that the propensity of alpha helix is more than one then these six residues together will be predicted as an helix so the helical region is extended in both the direction until the probability of alpha helix score becomes smaller than 1.0 so what do we do in the next round so let's say we have scanned the first six residues okay so after scanning first six residues and we are saying that if out of six four have propensity values more than one then for the entire six well stretch we'll say that the entire six residues are going to make alpha helix then what are we going to do we are going to leave first residue and then from amino acid number two to amino acid number seven we are going to calculate propensity values again and then we will shift in the right direction we will go to the right of our sequence right because in order to extend to the next part of the uh, protein sequence so we are going to predict it as is it predict the strand predict the you know secondary structure as helix till the probability of alpha helix is less than one 
so that it ha- that is how it is done the example here is given in terms of uh, alpha helix but it can be beta or it can be coil so for beta strand similar scanning is done but with the window size of 5 residues and uh, you know sometimes it happens that for a uh, certain uh, uh, region a prediction is made and uh, there is a you know ch- there is a chance that it can either be a beta or it can be a alpha helix and there is a, like a tie so then the final prediction is made based on the following criteria that whichever a uh, prediction either alpha helix or beta strand or let's say quite if whichever have the probability uh, propensity values addition of the propensity values more then it will be declared as a alpha helix otherwise it will be declared as a beta strand now the next algorithm in this category is called as gor method and gor stands for garnier oscoud propsin method which we have discussed earlier and it is also based on the propensity of each amino acid residue to be in one of the four conformational states which is helix strand turn and coil so however instead of using the propensity value from a single residue to predict a conformational state it takes short range interactions of neighboring residues into account so it examines a window of every 17 residues and sums up the propensity scores for all the residues for each of the four states so in this particular algorithm the earlier chow fastman it was doing prediction for helix strand and uh, coil but this uh, gor method has incorporated turn also so let me tell you what is the difference between a turn and a coil so A coil is longer in length while a turn is shorter in length and a turn is mostly seen in secondary structure in in the in the protein structures when they are connecting two secondary structures together for example uh, the connection between two helices or the connection between a beta strand and alpha helix so when the connection is smaller in length it is called as a turn otherwise when the connections connections are very long you know wrong rope like so then they are called as coils so uh in like in garnier and like in chow fastman for alpha helix we were taking into consideration the 6 6 uh 6 as the length of the window size here in gor method we are examining the windows we are examining by taking the window size of 17 residues and then we are adding the propensity scores of all the residues of each of the four states in the four summed values so now what we are going to do we are going to find out the propensity value for all the states and the highest score state defines the conformational state for the center residue in the window so the gor method has been shown to be more accurate than chow fastman because it takes the neighboring effect of residues into consideration so both chow fastman and gor method which are the first generation method and were developed in 1970s they suffer from the fact that the prediction rules are somewhat arbitrary because they are based on single sequence statistics and uh, there is no clear relation to the known protein folding theories also so these type of algorithms are solely relying on local sequence information and they fail to take into consideration the long range interactions and you already know that in order to uh, you know a uh, predict a beta sheet you need to have long range interactions but we still not have you know uh, algorithms to do that so chow fastman based predictions you know does not even consider the short range environmental information and these reasons combined with the unreliable statistics derived from a very small structural database they limit the prediction accuracies of these methods to about 50% So this performance is considered dismal, you know, and any random prediction can have a forty percent accuracy. Given a fact that in globular proteins, the three-state distribution is thirty percent helix, twenty percent beta strand, and fifty percent coil. So you know, all it is saying is that at any given point of time, and even after so much of you know uh, errors which can happen, eh, these programs can at least be forty percent accurate at any point of time. So this is the uh, web page home page of uh, one of the software which is hosting GOR uh prediction algorithm 
So now let's talk about homology based method. So what we talked about just now was ab initio based and the literal meaning of ab initio is to start from the scratch and we were not relying on any information from homology based methods there. So now the uh, third generation algorithms, they are called as homology based methods and they were developed in late 1990s and by making use of evolutionary information. So that is why they are called as homology based methods. So this type of method, it combines both the ab initio secondary structure prediction of the individual sequences and alignment information for multiple homologous sequences. So for example, it works when the identities are you know, like uh, are more than 35% between the homologous sequences. So what was the idea behind this approach? So it was that, you know, the proteins which are close homologs to each other, they should have same type of secondary and tertiary structure. So those proteins which are like so much, so very much homologous to each other, their residues are very much matching to each other. So the chances of erroneous prediction while using the homology approach is going to be very less. So whenever, so when the homology concept was also added to the ab initio based methods, then the prediction accuracy was raised to another 10% over the second generation method. So this is how, uh, you know, fruitful the homology based methods are. So this is how it is done. So for example, you have done a multiple sequence alignment and let's say this the last sequence here, which you see is the one which is the query for you. Okay. And you want to predict the secondary structure of each of, uh, of the protein of the sequence, which of the query sequence, which is, which is at the end. All right. So what the program is going to do is it is first of all going to do a multiple sequence alignment with the other homologous sequences. So let's say your query is insulin and all the five sequences over the, these uh, your query sequence are also insulin. So now the individual sequences, first of all, through Chow Fastman or Gore method was converted into a secondary structure. And then, you know, uh, we, we took a consensus of all the sequences and now finally we are predicting the uh, secondary structure of your query sequence. So you may ask where was the homology part was taken into consideration. So my dear friends, the homology is taken care of in the first step itself when we did multiple sequence alignment. Do you know why we did multiple sequence alignment here? You knew that your protein was for, let's say in this example was insulin. So you took out another insulin proteins from the database and you multiply aligned them because, and you, uh, what, what do we get after doing multiple alignment? After doing multiple alignment, we place uh, matching portions over each other. So when we place matching portions over each other, and that too, which are sequentially matching. So imagine when I'm converting them into uh, secondary structures and then they, I'm taking their final consensus, the prediction accuracies have further improved because you aligned the proteins in the first step by following the homology. So this is the place where you are using the homology and this is the place where you are using the ab initio approach and in the final step you are taking the consensus of both of them. So this is how uh, the programs are designed uh, you know these days. So now uh, the third generation prediction algorithm, they also extensively apply sophisticated neural networks. So neural network is one of the mathematical concepts we use in bioinformatics. We have hidden Markov models, we have neural networks. And uh, these algorithms are used for many other purposes also. For example, the prediction of genes, or prediction of promoters, prediction of transcription factor binding sites, and many other things. And similarly, we are using uh, neural networks for the prediction of the protein secondary structures. So a neural network is divided into three parts. The first part, you know, uh, is it, you know, is this the call is called as the first layer, which is the input layer. And the last uh, layer, the last part is called as the output layer. And in between the, uh, you know, the actual work happens, which is hidden from the user. And what happens is we first train our algorithm uh, by, uh, you know, making the algorithm see that which type of amino acid are making which type of 
uh you know secondary structures in general and when we train our algorithm for reading which type of amino acids are used more for making which type of secondary elements now then when we give our test data to this algorithm it predicts predicts for us and it tells us that what the query is going to make eventually it is similar to our minds you know you if i'll show you a picture of a smiley on my screen you will probably say that it is a human being smiling right because we have been trained to look at the smiley and feel that a human is smiling right similarly we are training our software here to see what we want our software to see and when we give a test data to our software it uh, further you know predicts for us so this is one of the software called as cypred which is used for the prediction of secondary structures and uh, you know because no individual method can always predict the structures correctly so it is uh, desirable and it is also you know uh it is also uh, known that if you will combine predictions from multiple programs then it will improve the accuracy of your prediction in fact you know the programs which are coming up these days they mostly uh, are uh, following the you know multiple approaches so this is how the output of cypred looks go check this software also So thank you for watching patiently. If you have any questions, please put your questions in the comment section. I will definitely get back to you. And in my next video, I am going to talk about the prediction of the secondary structures of uh, transmembrane proteins. In this video, we covered the globular proteins. In the another video, we'll be bringing you the prediction of the transmembrane proteins. Thanks for watching.